to tonight's forum and thank you for attending our meeting on such a perfect summer's evening. This shows your commitment to Tama County. I'm Janet Wilson and I'm married to Bill Wilson, a fourth generation farmer in the Tri-City area. That's actually between Trayer, Geyser, and Gutierrez. Tonight we will have a PowerPoint presentation followed by questions from the audience. You can raise your hands now if you have questions written on any cards already, or you can write any other questions that arise during the program and we can collect those later. Tonight, you may notice we are not referring to the industrial wind projects as farms, as they are not farms. The industry chose that word to be appealing to the public. It sounds rustic, wholesome, and so very Iowan. But they are industrial projects generating electricity and taking valuable farmland out of production across Iowa and other states. They should not get conditional approval or be zoned for placement on ag land. Therefore, tonight, we will call them what they are, industrial wind projects. Our facilitators will do their best to answer all your questions. If further research is needed, we will get back to you and can post the answers on our Facebook page as well. I would like to introduce our facilitators for the evening. John Winkle Fleck is our Tama County Against Turbines chair and spokesperson. He and his family live outside the geyser where they raise cattle and crops. Their family farming operation stretches from around geyser to Dinsdale and includes here down to Vining. John believes we are caretakers of the land and he believes it is up to us to help protect the precious land that is some of the most productive in the world, as well as our quality of life for future generations here in Tama County. Kathy Kraft the Harkema is our media coordinator. She is a Dyser native and raises crops and livestock as part of her family's farming operation in Tama County. She sees industrial wind turbines as far as she can see in every direction from her home in Powersheet County, day and night. She doesn't want to see her family's farm south of Dyser suffer the same loss of prime farmland and quality of life from the industrial wind projects that are preying on Tim County. Heather Wilson Canevel is our compliance coordinator. You can't hear that. Sorry. Three so three microphones on the can't hear that. Well, turn it right. You need to do that or read sorry. We'll try again. Oh boy. That's better. Um, okay, I'll start over. Did you guys know John Michael Black? He's, I won't read it again. He's our Tim County and Sherbine Sharon spokesperson. Kathy Kraft Gaharkama is our media coordinator. She's a Dyser native and raises crops and livestock as part of her family's farming operation in Tama County. She sees industrial wind turbines as far as she can see in every direction from her home in Powersheet County, day and night. She doesn't want to see her family's farm south of Dyser suffer the same loss of prime farmland and quality of life as she has in Powersheet County. Heather Wilson Neville is our compliance coordinator. She was born in Waterloo and has lived in rural Trayer her entire life. Her husband Aaron and their two young children live on an acreage outside of Trayer on Highway 63. She loves her acreage and her beautiful home, which is only a couple of miles away from her parents and her home farm. They built a new house on the acreage in 2017, not knowing that industrial wind turbines would be coming into their backyard in the future. She's passionate about her family, her health, her livelihood, her property, farmland, and helping others who don't have a voice right now to speak. Richard Arp is our treasurer. He now resides in Dyser, but still raises cattle and crops on his fourth generation farm east of Cloutier. He will be taking the audience's questions after the PowerPoints. Many of you are getting information on industrial wind projects from multiple sources. 
I would like to share a tip from Iowa State University. On my first day there, they recommended while reviewing facts, we should consider the source and what that source may be able to gain from it. I hope you find tonight's presentation informative and motivating. I will now turn the meeting over to John. Thank you, Jan Thank you, Janet. We're so grateful to have so many of you join us here tonight to get the facts about industrial wind turbines. Here's what we'll highlight tonight. And I assure you that um, we'll make time to address any of your questions in public so the public gets the same information. And um, that's kind of our focus for tonight. And uh, Yep, if you have any questions, please write them on an index card and hand them to one of our volunteers. You may submit questions at any time and we'll address them later. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Kathy Krafka Harkema, who will pro provide an overview about the current state of industrial wind projects here in Iowa. Kathy? Well, thank you, John. We appreciate all of you coming out tonight. We've still got folks that are coming in, so make your way and have a seat. So a little bit about uh, the wind project and the solar industry. You have all been subsidizing those industries. And in fact, wind and solar have received subsidies from the US federal government for about 44 years now. And for example, last year to the tune of the investment tax credit for solar cost you as the taxpayers about $60 billion with a B. The production tax credit, often called PTCs, that funds the wind industry cost you $53 billion with a B to subsidize wind projects. Now, those production tax credits actually expired at the beginning of 2022. You may have heard a little bit in the news, a lot of people were either happy for Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia or not happy with him for not going along with renewing those production tax credits. But as of now, Congress has not renewed those for wind construction. Put it in perspective, we're putting 60 billion and 53 billion into solar and wind, respectively, over the uh, decade from 2021 to 2031, and yet the oil and gas sector only got about 29 billion, and nuclear got a minuscule bit at about 3.4 billion. So we're here tonight to help you understand a little bit about what wind, the state of wind is and could be here in Tama County. Now, I've got a farm down in Powashee County. If, how many of you have driven down Highway 63 or V18 and gone into Powashee County? You know, there's wind turbines everywhere. Montezuma, Deep River, they're everywhere. They're thick. There's three wind projects in Powashee County. Two are owned or operated by Mid-American Energy and one by Alliant Energy. And this is what it looks like when you look around Montezuma. It's not a pretty look if we go to this. This is what you see every night. Flashing red lights every night, all the time. And as annoying it is to us as people, it's really annoying to livestock too and to wildlife. Now, if you don't want to see all those flashing red lights like that in Tama County in your future for the rest of your life, we want you to pay attention tonight because we're going to talk about why Tama County's ordinances can and do better to protect our public health and our public safety for us now and for future generations. And they're here to tell you what's going on in terms of two wind projects that are proposed for Tama County is Heather Knibble. Heather? <coughs> Thanks, Kathy. All right, so let's talk about the two projects that currently are coming to Tama County or trying to. So the first one is, um, it's initially started in rural Tama County from 150th Street from Trader to Dysart. 
south to Clutier and Elbrun. So this one is called Winding Stair Project, is what it's called, by Apex. Up to 210 megawatts could power 76,000 U.S. homes. Tama County's population was 16,155 in 2020, with 6,767 households. What happens is the energy goes on an electrical grid. It does not necessarily stay in the area. The number of proposed industrial wind turbines with this project is around 50 to 70 turbines. The turbine size, blade length, tower height, and manufacture are not disclosed yet. And again, the project is backed by Apex Clean Energy in Charlottesville, Virginia. So why is Tama County being targeted by industrial developers, you may ask? Tama County's 24-year-old regulations permit more turbines to be placed closer at only 1,000 feet from your home, including those non-participating owners, or those properties. Many counties have moratoriums. You've probably seen it in the news. There's, you know, Grundy, a lot of our local areas, are, are, they're doing moratoriums. Um, and some of those have much more stringent regulations compared to Tama County. Access to transmission lines is another thing. So along the old railroads, right-of-ways, between Dyser, Trainer, and other electric transmission line near El Baron to transmit the power on the grid. So again, why pray on Tama County? Salt Creek Project was approved in the COVID pandemic. You know that time a couple years ago when we couldn't even go visit our family members? That was when it was approved during that whole 2020 year. Industrial wind project owners and developers, they can cash in on production tax credits and incentives. Tama County's minimal outdated regulations, they're not very, they're just not good. So that's where these companies, they come on in. Salt Creek is a project developer and they reportedly are seeking a phase two. So let's go back one quick, Kathy. So on this one, this is actually phase, phase one is what this is right here. Um, we have a map up here afterwards or you can Google Salt Creek Wind and you can see this map, but this is the approved in the 2020 COVID pandemic um, project. 60 turbines where all those yellow spots are the, are the turbines and the green is all of the transmission lines. Um, so again, it, it has not started, um, but that's what it looks like there. All right, so Salt Creek Project again. So let's, let's take a look here. So if approved, the proposed Salt Creek Phase 2, it'll surround Toledo from the north and east. I know we're all here in Toledo tonight, so if you weren't aware of that, if this is approved, it's going to be to the northeast of Toledo. And it pretty much stretches to E29 is where it's at. And it's going to be visible from town. If you live in Tama Toledo, they say they're 550 to 650 foot tall. So you're going to see the red lights, as Kathy showed. You're going to have to drive through them, the roads as they put these in. So just keep that in mind. So if you look up here, the approved phase one project is right there. That's in about Crystal Township there between Labyrinth, Trayer, Garland is where that first area is. That's not built again, around 60 turbines is what they plan to do there. The next project right south of that is the proposed project. So that is the Salt Creek Phase 2, not approved, 25 to 35 turbines. They do have easement signed already. Um, they previously had mentioned this summer they were planning to ask for that conditional use permit for that. So keep that in mind. Um, up at the top is the Vienna Wind Farm. So if you've been by Gladbrook, and it also stretches into Marshall County. So up there we got um, the Vienna. There's part of those are in Tama County. There's 20 of them, and then the rest are in Marshall. Um, so that's that area there. And then there's this picture on the left. At least we have a big screen so you guys can see this well. And if you watch our, our Facebook page, you've probably seen this. And thank you, Jeff, for the, the wonderful picture. Um, so what I want to do here is I'm going to read you from the conditional use permit what should be done by the developer to make this um, 
follow the permit. So, I'm just going to read it word for word, and you guys let me know what you think. So, a gravity drain will be installed in the base of each excavation to keep the excavations deep watered. So if you can't tell by the picture, that's, that's water. Don't know how deep, the, the permit said it was 65 foot wide and 12 foot hole, deep of a hole. So that is water in there. The drains will be daylighted if grades allow or tied into available existing field drain tile systems. The stockpiles will be hydro seeded and a six foot temporary safety fence will be installed around the perimeter of the excavation. So that brown is, is dirt, so that's not seeded. Um, there's some noxious weeds around there. It's, it's not being weeded. And mind you, these farmers are farming. They're actively farming this land. It's out there in the middle of the field. And from the picture, I don't see any safety fence. So keep that in mind. And we will move on to the next slide. All right, so Salt Creek Wind Project proposed phase two, as mentioned. So again, this is gonna come pretty close to Toledo. Um, we have a map up here, it's a little easier to read if you wanna, if you're interested in seeing, we have one down front for afterwards. Um, but it's pretty much from about E29 again to um, Toledo is uh, down here in this area here. Uh, we got a full map over there. So that is the area that is currently being looked at for that phase two. It was around 2021 primarily that they were um, signing those easements. Okay. So again, just to reiterate, um, we got Salt Creek Wind by Conifer Power. Um, phase one, 60 proposed turbines. There is 10 of those mud pads constructed um, that I showed that picture there. Phase two, not approved, 25 to 30 turbines. Line and stairs by Apex, not approved, 50 to 70 turbines. So I want to draw, so Apex is up here. Um, you got Dyser would be surrounded there in the original footprint. And then we got Traer, uh, Clutier, and Elberon. So that, that's kind of the area there. And we have heard of them going outside of their boundaries. So there's a lot, it's pretty much that gap that you see in between Salt Creek and, and Apex. There's farmers getting asked to sign right there, as well as to the north, and as well as, there's been a little bit of talk about even coming west of Trigger. So I would say, until our ordinances get updated, you might as well just draw a big red square around this entire county. I mean, I, I just, this week, heard of solar coming around in big industrial farms of solar, running 400 acres. It's, it's crazy, guys. These ordinances are, are old, and technology has changed, so. I um, wanted to give you guys a, a good view of that. All right, so the next uh, slide here. Once you sign an easement, we have seen some cases, this is an app called Landslide that a lot of realtors use. There are some farmers that after they have signed with Apex Winding Stairs, their name does not show on this app anymore. It now says Winding Stair Project LLC. So that farmer has literally gave their rights to their land to winding stairs to where this app does not even say their name. Just think about that, guys. That hard-earned farm that has been passed down is now in someone else's name. So here to tell us more about how Tama County's outdated commercial wind ordinances play a role in developers praying on Tama County, here is Kathy Kravka Hartman. Kathy? Well, thank you, Heather, and that's a pretty sobering fact because, you know, you work generations to buy and keep and earn a farm and pass it down to the next generation, and with a stroke of the pen, you can literally sign it away. So we think that's very important to uh, pay attention to. Also, we think it's important here as we talk about this tonight to help you understand the current state of Tama County's ordinances. For example, we've got ordinances that were put into effect in 1998. That's 24 years ago. Tama County's wind ordinance was part of the master zoning ordinance at that time. And then in 2010, the commercial wind energy provisions were separated out into a standalone ordinance. 
but nothing of substance changed in that time. And as Heather said and John has said, the wind turbine technology has changed significantly in 24 years and even since 2010. So for example, our ordinances say nothing, nothing about shadow flicker. And shadow flicker, if you haven't seen it or heard of it, it's like right before your lights go off and on, before the power goes out. They literally can blink very fast for one to two seconds. And that's when that turbine blade is going around and the earth is close to the sun. And we've actually got a video on our Facebook uh, page and our YouTube channel. Shadow flicker is occurring in July already in the turbines in Powersheet County. But it can be very disorienting to people. It can even cause seizures in some people or aggravate migraines. There's also infrasound. Nothing in Tama County's ordinance addresses infrasound. And that's essentially, you can't always hear it, but it's a pressure. And it's, it's like what animals experience before severe weather. And it can be really debilitating. And there are uh, studies in Europe of people that are experiencing the negative effects of infrasound for as much as 7 to 12 miles away from wind turbines. It can cause insomnia at night. It can trigger and aggravate other health conditions. And again, our ordinances here in Tama County say nothing about shadow flicker or infrasound. Plus, our ordinances don't address a public complaint process. They don't even discuss or cover a comprehensive enforcement process. Our conditional use permits are open-ended. Once they are issued, they never expire. Most counties, they expire in one to two years. Not in Tama County. Also, these wind turbines today can be anywhere from 60 to 65, 68 stories tall. They are industrial electric manufacturing facilities. Most 60 to 65 story tall buildings would be considered a high rise building and they would be required by most building codes to have their own fire suppression or sprinkler system in them. Anybody here in the crowd a volunteer firefighter or have somebody in their family that is a volunteer firefighter? Well, we don't have hook and ladder trucks around here in the country that go up 60 storms. So if these turbines catch fire and they don't have their own fire suppression system in them, you know, there's a high risk of that fire spreading and just having to burn out especially if it's a fire in the fall, we've got dry corn and soybean fields. Also, just throughout the uh, language, our ordinance is way out of date, almost a quarter of a century of a year old now here, so it's in need of updating. Also, our ordinance allows far too much sound. We permit 60 decibels of sound in our current ordinance. And if you don't know what that looks like or sounds like, we invite you to go on our YouTube channel and we've got some Tama County turbines recorded at the Vienna Wind Farm. And we'll show you that later tonight. Also, as Heather said, those setbacks are far too close because turbines have gotten bigger, taller, faster, but yet we still allow them only a thousand feet from your house or two times the turbine height here in Tama County. We think that should be at least 2,000 feet and at least four times the turbine blade length. And why is that important? Because these turbine blades ice up in the winter. And when they start back up again, that ice is like being in a huge hailstorm, as that ice is a missile and a projectile that comes flying off of those. So that's very important to keep these turbines far away from uh, people. And we think they should be set back not only just from a house, but from a property line. Because if your neighbor signed up for a turbine and you didn't, we think it's wrong that your neighbor can encroach on your property with a wind turbine. So we think the ordinances should be set back, not only from a house, but from a property line. Also, our ordinances fail to adequately address decommissioning. Decommissioning is a fancy word for saying the cost of removing a wind turbine and returning the land to its original state. Today, the cost to remove a turbine is anywhere from a half million to a quarter of a million dollars per turbine. So, you know, if you're thinking about signing up for an easement, those annual payments, you're gonna take a lot of annual payments to equal up to a half million dollars or a quarter of a million dollars to remove it. 
Tama County's ordinance doesn't require the developer to put that money aside in escrow up front. Instead, Tama County says, well, 15 years in, you can have that money put aside. Well, a lot of these wind companies are here today, gone tomorrow, and aren't even around for 15 years. Or the company that started to do business and get the permits with the county flips that project off. And a project might be sold multiple times before it even gets to the 15 year mark. So we think it's important for Tama County to think about the future and those decommissioning costs up front to require that in escrow up front at the point of application uh, to prove that a developer has the money set aside to remove the turbine and restore the land to its original state. That's uh, the case in a lot of counties that we study for other ordinances, and that's what modern ordinances do, is they adequately cover the de decommissioning costs and they don't leave the landowner holding the bag, or perhaps even team a county. You know, because you just can't go out there and take down a wind turbine yourself. <laughs> they're big, they're heavy, they're monstrous. And also, I'd like to just uh, point out, John Winkleplek has some great information to share. John and I, our family farms, are right on the border with Benton County. John's got some good insight to share about what the folks about Benton County have learned and the thing or two about their land ordinances. So, John? Thank you, Kathy. I was given the opportunity a while back um, to attend the Benton County Board of Supervisors meeting. I was very impressed. They had a Canadian <coughs> developer come to their supervisor's meeting. One of the supervisors asked the lady, she said, well, I, they asked her, I'm surprised you didn't call ahead and ask what our ordinances are. Because usually when they call ahead, we no longer see you anymore. Benton County's ordinance, as it currently is, will not allow any industrial turbines on land with a CSR of 70 or greater. We have a lot to learn from Benton County in several aspects. Benton County uses its zoning and regulations to protect its highly productive farmland. For example, Benton County land ordinances and regulations prohibit using highly productive land with a CSR 70 or more for wind or solar. On June 7th, a number of our coalition members and I attended the Benton County Board of Supervisors meeting. Like I said, where a Canadian developer came in, assumed the county would approve an industrial wind project. Boy, was that lady wrong. Tama County regulations governing industrial wind projects haven't kept up with the times. They allow for industrial wind turbines to be placed only a thousand feet, a thousand feet, or two times the turbine height from your home. That isn't enough. That isn't right. And that's why so many people are speaking up now to get Tama County to update its regulations with the times. Wind turbines, they have changed a lot. Worth County, Iowa provides a modern, comprehensive industrial wind ordinance. As of, two, as of the 2020 U.S. Census, Worth County's population was 7,743. Worth County is on the Iowa-Minnesota border, and Northwood serves as their county seat. By comparison, Tama County population in the 2020 Census was 17,135. Tama County can learn from the process Worth County went through to update its zoning and wind regulations to better protect the people, <coughs> livestock, wildlife, and farmland. 
It is my it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce tonight's main speaker, Jeff Gorbel. He is with the Worth County Planning and Zoning. He is the chair. Jeff. Thank you. Can everybody can you hear me in the back and up top? Good. I'm gonna set the microphone down. I uh, I grew up in the Marine Corps just talking loud to microphones and I we don't we don't work very well together. Um, for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, I think it should be, I hope it will be very informative. Um, I do want to apologize up front when we get to it. Uh, we learned as we were doing a run through before the meeting that my last slide uh, didn't make it onto the presentation. Uh, you're having a hard time hearing me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, is it on? Yeah. You hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, so the, the last slide in my presentation didn't make it onto the machine up top, and evidently it's a Mac and the tech guy was gone, so uh, when we get to my very last slide, I'm just gonna have to read to you uh, what was on it. Uh, so again, I've got eight slides tonight. I didn't create a, a two-hour presentation. There's a lot of information involved when we talk about wind ordinances. Um, so I'm going to put a, a highlight on some of the things that I think are critical uh, about these issues. And I think there's some very strong parallels between what happened in Worth County and what is happening right now in, in Tama. Uh, after the presentation, I know that they've got cards. If you've got questions, please write those down and, and provide them so that we can uh, go, through those go through those questions in conversation and close any gaps that my presentation may have for you. Um, I'll walk through what I think some of the parallels are between Worth County and Tama County, uh, and then I'm gonna uh, talk about what our philosophy was in Worth County, how we went through this process, uh, and then I'll go through a timeline of what we did and talk just very briefly on, on some of the, uh, the things that are in our ordinance. Now, before I get started though, uh, I do want to ask a couple of questions. I want to get a sense of the audience and I want to make a couple of points later on. So how many people are in the room today are against wind turbines? Just show of hands. Okay. Quite a number of them. I would say the majority of the folks that are here. Now, how many people in the room today uh, are in favor of wind ordinances or in favor of uh, wind turbines rather uh, under some common sense rules? A few people. Okay. Are there any landowners in the audience today that have easements, that signed easements with the wind turbine company? No, that's unfortunate. How about uh, government officials in the room? Supervisors, zoning commission, board of adjustment, anything? Any? Got one? Oh, two. Got two? Good, good. Uh, and then are there any persons in the room tonight that work for a, uh, an energy company that owns or operates or will be owning or operating wind turbines? None. That's unfortunate. Yeah, if you, if you listen to it, who I was asking to raise hands, it really identified all of the different stakeholders that are involved in these questions. And it, uh, I think it's important that um, we're all talking to each other and that everybody knows what's going on and if we got folks that are not willing to engage in the conversation then it's not going to work very well um, so that kind of brings me to the very first thing of, uh, of my presentation it goes all the way back to the constitution you know, the preamble starts with we the people it didn't go up there we go it says we the people of the united states <clears throat> excuse me it then goes on to present why the Constitution is necessary. Uh, essentially, as it was established in the Declaration of Independence, uh, it establishes that the people are the entities that are vested with the inalienable rights. Okay. 
the people decided that in order to guide a civil society, some government was needed to establish some common rules under which that society would operate. But it says that the government was formed for the express purpose of protecting the people's rights via establishment and enforcement of the rules necessary for a civil society. So those plus the protection of life and property are the fundamental reasons for government rules. So that's why the rules exist, that's why we have them, is to maintain a civil society. Now, <clears throat> we saw from our show of hands that there were some people here from a, a variety of different groups. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the various groups that were represented tonight, but the reality is, if we're gonna protect everyone's rights, then we're gonna have to talk with each other. And we're gonna have to understand each other's perspectives and then find common ground to ensure that each person's rights are protected. That means that the common ground needs to be enshrined in laws and rules. And in those laws, we have to ensure that the government and private industry don't trample on the rights of the individual, we the people. We are where the rights begin. And that pretty much sums up the philosophy that drove our approach as we worked through these issues in North County. And I tell you, Excuse me, it took a lot longer than I, I hoped it would. Uh, if I were king, I could have done it faster. And I would have had some additional rules. But I wasn't king. Nobody in this room is king. So simply put, we have to recognize the reality of the situation. There's a lot of stuff about commercial wind projects that we as a zoning commission didn't know when we started. We had to talk to people about it. There's a lot that the citizens that were signing easements with the wind company didn't know about the easements that they were signing. We had to talk them through those things. So we have to talk with each other. And lastly, we have to recognize that our rules and laws governing the civil society need to change as the situation warrants. In fact, in a couple of slides I'm gonna show you, the Iowa Supreme Court has said that. The Iowa Supreme Court has said they expect these laws to change. Now, let's go through just real quick a couple of the parallels between Worth County and Tama County. And this, this, by the way, is not unique to Worth County and Tama County. We saw this when we were doing our research. This is happening all across the state of Iowa and in fact, the United States at large. Uh, first of all, is the issue with the age of ordinances. You, know, you just heard Kathy talk about the ordinance here in, Worth Ca in uh, Tama County is nearly a quarter of a century old. It was last approved in 2010, but it was virtually unchanged from that which was approved in 1998. This, uh, uh, in Worth County, well, we didn't have a wind ordinance, we had a zoning ordinance. And that zoning ordinance only applied to three of our 12 townships. So three quarters of the county had virtually no rules whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna talk about that in, in just a second. But the, what we did have in the zoning talked about conditional use permits. And you heard Heather talk about the open-ended uh, fashion of the Tama County permits. Our permits were just as open-ended and the permits for, for wind, the commercial use permit, just simply said you had to have a conditional use permit in three of the townships. The other township, just do whatever the hell you want. There were no rules. That's all we had. That's what we started with. Now, what happened was there were some projects that came in, just as what's happening here in Tama County. Some projects coming in, people are going, whoa, what is this? and why are these things so close, and how many are there, and why did this impact, and why did that impact? In Worth County, it was a project called Freeborn Wind. It was called Freeborn Wind because that was the name of the county that the wind project was supposed to go into in Minnesota, Freeborn County, Minnesota. Freeborn County, Minnesota had rules that the energy company didn't like, so they looked across the border, they spied Worth County that had nine townships that had no rules, no zoning, and they said, we'll go there. So they installed a bunch of them in uh, Deer Creek and Grove townships. They made agreements with the supervisors 
that dealt with the use of county roads, right-of-ways, and drainage, and they verbally told the supervisors how many turbines would go in, and verbally promised the supervisors how far away they would be, 1,500 to 2,000 feet, and then when the project was over, there were more turbines than they said they were gonna be, they were taller than they said they were gonna be, and they were as close as 800 feet to people's homes. <laughs> in Worth County and Tama County, new projects are coming in. In Worth County, it's a project called Worthwhile Wind. They wanna put turbines in virtually the entire west half of the county. In Tama County, you heard Heather talk about the projects that are coming in here. In Worth County, that served to wake people up. In Tama County, it looks like it's serving to wake people up. Citizens wake up and say, we got to do something about this. We need some protections. Our rules are old. These are going to take time to address. You can't just change these rules overnight. These are complex issues. So we need to take a pause, enact a moratorium, research the issue, I have the conversations with everybody, identify the rules that make sense, implement them rules and say, okay, now submit your, per your, your permit applications. As soon as you start talking about that, those new projects add the urgency and highlight concerns and as soon as the energy companies hear about it, uh, down here, bottom, uh, energy companies threaten the county government. I understand this happened in Tama County, it did happen in Worth County. As soon as the citizens' petitions went to the supervisors, and the supervisors even engaged in conversation about should we have a moratorium, should we look at updating our rules, before they even discussed what that resolution might look like, they received a letter from the energy company's hired attorney threatening litigation as soon as it happened. We're gonna talk about that. I'm sorry? Was that a, did you have a question? So I'm gonna use these next two slides to talk about this legal threat to our supervisors. <clears throat> and, and they're veiled in the title up there, it's called Vested Rights. Now, legal threats seem to be especially common for our rural counties, you know, the, the smaller counties. Our county attorneys, our general county attorneys, they don't have expertise in this area. And these energy companies, you know, they've got these folks on a retainer. They, they're, they're using them all the time and all the time. And the fact that their go-to approach is to threaten litigation as soon as somebody starts talking about rules or changing rules, speaks quite a lot to the motivation and the character of those companies. Rather than reach out and say, look, we understand you've got hundreds, perhaps thousands of citizens that are upset, that have questions, that want to see their century or their, their, their decades old rules updated, Let's talk through these things. Instead of doing that, their go-to approach is to threaten litigation and invoke a variety of additional scare tactics, uh, frankly, many of which are false. Um, in fact, I believe your, your zoning commission received a letter recently, um, for all intents and purposes, from the uh, uh, attorney of the energy company saying, you shouldn't have any more zoning commission meetings talking about this stuff. It, it's bogus. It's got, Nothing to do with that. Yeah, the threats work for them. People are scared. So I think it's time to review some of these issues associated with vested rights. Now, vested rights is a real thing. It's legally used to protect people that have a permit from changes to rules after the permit has been issued. So if you go to the county, you apply for a building permit, they, give, they grant you a building permit. Vested rights says that you're allowed to build your building based on the rules that were in place when your permit was issued, even if they change the rules the following week. Now, 
in some cases, with these larger projects that take years, that may not start for a year or two years after the permit was issued, they may not still have vested rights. The reality is the court will decide if they have vested rights. And what happens is the individual, the energy company in this case, if you change the rules after the permit was issued or certainly before it was issued, if the, the energy company wants to claim vested rights, they petition the court to be granted an exception from your rules to be granted these vested rights. The court will go through a fact-finding process and decide the case based on the facts. And most of the time, the county's insurance company will pick up the tab for that because when the energy company files a petition with the court, the county's going to have to respond. And so if somebody petitions the court, the county isn't necessarily going to have to uh, uh, pay those costs out of pocket. The insurance will pick it up. Now, the reality is there's two ways <clears throat> that people can be granted vested rights. The first and most common through zoning uh, is your grandfather did. Most zoning ordinances, and I know Tama County's uh, zoning ordinance, just like the Worth County zoning ordinance, has a whole chapter on non-conforming activities. Non-conforming activities means you have something that's in place before the rules were changed. You're allowed to keep that thing in place even though the rules have changed. You just can't redo it again. It's your grandfathered in is the, the common way that it's, it's referred to. The second way to have vested rights and be granted an exemption is, as I said, is for somebody to petition the court. So an energy company would have to file a petition with the court and say, Tama County changed their rules after they gave us a permit, or they changed their rules before they gave us a permit, or they're thinking about changing their rules before we even submit our application. We want the court to grant us vested rights to say we're exempt from those new rules. They have to go to a court and ask that, and the court will decide. The court will either rule in favor of that petition and say, yes, you're granted an exemption to those new rules, or no, you have to abide by those new rules, or something in between. And that's it. The court does not fine the county for the county enforcing its rules. The court does not fine the county because the county is taking its obligation and updating its rules as it's necessary. That's not what the courts do. That's not what vested rights is about. Now, with regard to vested rights and uh, zoning changing, uh, changing zoning laws, let me show you some things that the Iowa Supreme Court has said. So the Iowa Supreme Court said, zoning is dynamic and changing with any existing restrictions being always subject to reasonable revisions in light of changing community conditions and needs as they appear. So straight away, if Tama County is looking at their ordinance and saying, geez, you know, this thing is pretty old. Technology has changed a lot. We've learned a lot. We should probably update our zoning laws. And then if an energy company says, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you, you, should, you, you shouldn't change that. Kaka. Iowa Supreme Court says these things are, are dynamic and changing. There's an expectation that the government for the people are going to update the rules as necessary to maintain that civil society. The Supreme Court has said property owners in the area affected by a zoning ordinance, as well as adjacent landowners, and I would say also, as well as energy companies that own land easements, have no vested right to the continuation of the current zoning. 
They've got no right to say, you can't change your zoning laws. These two findings, these two rulings from the Supreme Court give you the basis to say, we expect our laws to be maintained up to date. The Supreme Court of Iowa expects our laws to be maintained up to date. The Supreme Court has also said a zoning ordinance, including any amendments to it, carries a strong presumption of validity. So as long as it's gone through the process, what that zoning ordinance says, the Supreme Court said, you know, we're going to read the plain language and we assume it's valid. We assume it's valid to the extent that the Supreme Court says the challenger must show that the ordinance is unreasonable, arbitrary, capricious, or discriminatory with no reasonable relationship to the promotion of public health, safety, or welfare. Once again, the expectation is that our government is going to maintain our laws up to date so that we can maintain the civil society and protect the rights of the people. The Supreme Court has also said a moratorium aids a governing body in performing the legislative task of municipal planning. They aid in bridging the gap between planning and its implementation into legal measures. In other words, they recognize that on some of these issues, it's going to take a long time from the point in time which you say, we need to change our rules, to the time it takes to research what those changes should be, and then actually put those changes into an ordinance that is passed and on the books, can take a long time. And the Supreme Court has said a moratorium aids the governing body in performing that task. If you read on, it says they may be used to preserve the status quo while study of the area and its needs is completed, thus serving a significant public purpose. So for these complex issues that are going to take a lot of time to change the ordinance, the Supreme Court has said a moratorium is perfectly acceptable. It's a valid planning aid for you to say, we're going to take a pause on any more permits because we're going to change our laws and then go through the process of changing it. One step further, with regard to completion of work on a project that was previously permitted, so we're not talking about projects that are maybe going to happen. This is a project that has already been permitted in this Supreme Court case. He said, vested rights to continue development would not necessarily be true where the permittee had actual or constructive knowledge of the pendency of the zoning amendment at the time of the issue of the permit and the expenditures and work done under its authority. So in this case, somebody had a permit. It was taking them a long time to get started on their construction. The laws changed. The county tried to, uh, or city to enforce the new laws. They filed, the petitioner filed for vested rights and the court says, hey, you don't necessarily have vested rights just because you have a permit. You knew that the rules were changing and you haven't started your project yet. And they have, the, the court has a variety of tests that they'll go through to determine whether that person has the vested rights or not. So with that as a backdrop, let me share some additional things that happened in North County. Before Invenergy, which was the company with, uh, uh, that wants to do the worthwhile win, before they had presented even a plan to the county supervisors. They hadn't even shown them the area of the county that they wanted to talk about yet. As soon as they heard that we were talking about a moratorium and updating our rules, their legal counsel sent a letter threatening litigation and said, if you start to change your rules, or if you pass a moratorium, we're gonna take you to court. In light of all of that, and with my understanding of vested rights, and I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, I just know how to read. And so in light of all of that, I hired a firm out of Des Moines, out of my own pocket, not in the county, and asked them to draft a legal opinion on vested rights 
in light of what was happening in Worth County. And then I told him, I want you to send this letter to our county supervisors to educate them because they're being threatened by this energy company and our county, suit, our county attorney doesn't know anything about this stuff. He doesn't have that expertise. So I want them to have a legitimate legal opinion to help them understand what the reality really is. They got that legal opinion and they said, I think we need to hire an outside attorney to look into this stuff for us. These threats from the energy company don't have the basis that they seem to have on its face. My point in these two slides is to say, especially if there were any of the government body folks here, I know there were two of you here, and I won't ask what, what parts of the government you represent. Uh, but my point is to say, don't be scared by these threats. They're an attempt to get you to give up your rights or to get you to give up the rights of the citizens of Tama County and they're frankly bullying tactics. And we shouldn't succumb to bullies. We don't succumb to bullies in our schools. We don't succumb to bullies in our private lives. We shouldn't do so in local government either. The county supervisors, in my opinion, have a responsibility and an obligation to stand up to these threats and ensure that the rules are followed, the expectations are followed, and that the rules are updated as necessary to protect the rights of the citizens. So we're gonna put the vested rights behind us. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we went through in Worth County. Now, the process that we follow and the process that Tama County should be following is pretty much identical because it's dictated by Iowa law. The basis starts with Iowa Code 335.301 that establishes the authority of the county supervisors to make ordinances for express purposes. Now I would submit that it's not just the authority, but it's a form of an obligation that the supervisors take on when they're sworn into office. They're the ones that determine what the county ordinances should be and should say. But with regard to zoning, they don't make zoning ordinances by themselves. And the Board of Supervisors can't act on their own with regard to zoning. The code establishes the authority, or the code that establishes the authority for county zoning is code 335. It specifies in subsection 5 that zoning and associated ordinances should be designed to accomplish that which is laid out in a county comprehensive plan. And that plan and the ordinances that support it are supposed to be designed to achieve a variety of things that are spelled out in that code. Not least of which are a couple of things that go all the way back to my beginning slide, to the beginning of our Constitution. The primary purpose of government. It specifies one of the things that are supposed to, that these, the comprehensive plan and ordinances are supposed to do is protect our rights and general welfare of the citizens of the county. So it's not just a moral obligation, it's the law. Now that section of code 335.1, as I said, it lays out all of this stuff and, and identifies what these zoning laws are intended to achieve. It's very important and I encourage everyone to read it. Search for it online, it's, it's very easy to find. Now, it also says that the recommendations for zoning issues originate with the Zoning Commission. That's where the process starts. So, the ordinance process dictated by law says, first of all, you have to start with a county comprehensive plan. That comprehensive plan goes through drafts, it goes through public hearings, it gets uh, uh, reviewed by the Zoning Commission. In fact, the Zoning Commission probably leads that activity if it's not a separate uh, committee. But ultimately, that plan has to go through the Zoning Commission. The Zoning Commission makes the recommendations to the uh, supervisors after a public hearing. Changes are then determined. 
and then the supervisors get to vote. With regard to the zoning ordinances and, and related, the wind and zoning are identical. Um, they're supposed to carry out what the plan says. So in Benton County, if their plan says nothing on land that has, has a CSR of 70 or higher, well, I'm guessing their county comprehensive development plan says we want to protect our prime agricultural land and they've identified prime agricultural land as land which has a CSR of 70 or higher. And if that's what the plan says, then it makes sense that their wind ordinance says, well, our plan says we've got to protect prime agricultural land, so we're going to say you can't develop this kind of stuff on it because it takes it out of production. That's how these things are supposed to work. So with zoning ordinances, once again, they're drafted by the zoning commission. A new ordinance, a changed ordinance, a reapproved ordinance, it doesn't matter. If it deals with zoning, it starts with the zoning commission. The zoning commission has to have a public hearing. Then they make their final decision. Then they send it to the county board of supervisors. That's the report and recommendation that you see there. The county supervisors then have to have a public hearing, make any changes to the ordinance that they feel is necessary, and then they vote on it. Those are the steps that are dictated by Iowa statute. Now, on the next couple of slides, I had intended to provide some details on what happened in Worth County. Uh, unfortunately, we have just the one slide, so I will read to you uh, the last slide when I get to it. But this is the timeline that happened in Worth County. There's a lot on here, and I apologize for all of those points. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of them step by step. Uh, and these are just the main points on here, by the way. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the timing and the steps that were involved. In Worth County, it started in late February, early March, when the citizen petitions hit the supervisors. And the supervisors ultimately said, yep, we're going to pass a moratorium and that moratorium is going to be in effect until July 1st of 2022. Zoning Commission, I think you better get off your butt and update our ordinances. That's what we did. Again, that start was as a result of what had happened in Deer, in Deer Creek. All of those activities lasted through until June of this year when our wind ordinance was finally approved. Now we gave the wind ordinance to our supervisors all the way back in June of last year. But during all of this time, the energy company kept pestering our supervisors to sign off on a wholly separate agreement, telling our supervisors, you don't need to go through all of that stuff with the wind ordinance. It's not gonna apply to us anyway, because we have vested rights and we're gonna take you to court to prove it. So you might as well sign off on this agreement and we'll give you a few cookie crumbs of what it is that you're asking for. Meanwhile, the Zoning Commission was talking with the Energy representatives saying, hey, would you read our draft? We gave them a copy of our draft wind ordinance for them to read and give us feedback and they refused. Again, bullying tactics, they don't wanna work with the people, but it tied up our supervisors for a long time until finally in, uh, in late, 21, our supervisors finally said, we're not signing the agreement. It, it, one, one of the supervisors made a motion to approve it, and it failed for lack of a second. So then they started looking at the wind ordinance that we had drafted. They asked us to make some changes to it. We made those changes. Ultimately, they approved that in June. And in the interim, between late 21 and June, we turned around and worked on the, the zoning issue. We had told them as early as 2020 that our zoning was discriminatory because it was only zoned three of the 12 townships. Uh, but it took all of this to happen before they finally woke up and decided yes, the whole county should be zoned. Now, the last slide was gonna talk about our wind ordinance in particular. And the first thing that that last slide says was it, it was a, a, um, a paraphrase, if you will, of what 
our goal was, our, the Zoning Commission's goal, when we set out to craft a new wind ordinance for Worth County, our goal was to create a comprehensive ordinance that met the requirements of law and enable an orderly process for the development of commercial wind turbines in Worth County, consistent with the principles of safety, general welfare, and preservation of prime, pro of, uh, of prime property and citizen rights of current and future landowners. So that was the goal of our, our ordinance. And that theme was the underpinning of everything that we contemplated and eventually agreed to. Well, during our process, each of the five zoning members had an opportunity to bring up anything, say anything, agree or disagree on anything. And as I said, if each of us were king, we'd have done something different, but none of us were kings. Ultimately, what we developed, that we provided to the public for the initial uh, um, public hearing and review, that ordinance was unanimously agreed to by all five members of the Zoning Commission. We went through the public hearing, we got feedback, we got feedback from gobs of other agencies, I'll talk about those in a moment. We made our changes, and then our final copy, again, was unanimously agreed to by all five of our Zoning Commission uh, members when it went to our Board of Supervisors. Now, we spent a lot of effort and research in considering a wide range of topics, sources, and opinions. Uh, in fact, the next bullet on my slide was going to, actually there were uh, several bullets that said, we researched 38 ordinances from around all regions of Iowa. Tama County Ordinance was one of the ones that we reviewed. We reviewed state and federal guidelines related to commercial wind development. We sought and obtained input from five local government agencies and two wind development companies, including Invenergy, which they gave us an initial interview but then declined to give us any further input or feedback on what we were proposing. We performed hundreds of hours of research of peer-reviewed scientific journals on the topics. We reviewed dozens of unsolicited input received by individuals, groups, and business entities. We provided a preliminary draft to the public and all the entities that provided input to us. And we held public meetings and reviewed and considered all the submitted comments. Now, I mentioned that we reviewed Tama County among the 38 ordinances that we reviewed from all across Iowa. Uh, frankly, we found the Tama County ordinance was unfortunately consistent with a lot of the other ordinances that we found. They were ordinances that were written 20 years ago, 15 years ago, based on the state of technology at the time, based on the state of knowledge at the time, based on the state of experience at the time. Now keep in mind there wasn't a lot of these out there at that time, 20 years ago, and they were rather small. And when we looked at the Tango ordinance, as I said, we thought it was consistent with a bunch of the other ones that were frankly weak and out of date. And we made that determin early, determination early on because it, it very early in our process, we sat down and created a grid of 32 individual aspects, 32 individual topics that a wind ordinance should cover. Our review of Tama County felt that you addressed 13 of those 32. I haven't counted our ordinance, you know, that, we used that at the beginning, and I didn't go through our ordinance and count how many individual topics that we address in there now but I'm pretty sure we went beyond those original 32 that we had come up with before we started. And again, one of the things that we tried to do in our research was base our decisions on authoritative sources. We didn't spend any time on so-and-so's advocacy website for or against. We also looked at what was the source of that information. There's a lot of agencies out there that um, they brand themselves as, as uh, very official, lots of members, et cetera, et cetera, and they put out very official looking guidance and energy companies pass this stuff around. But as Kathy said, you have to look at these things and ask, well, what is their motivation behind this stuff? 
And if we can identify a motivation behind that, really tailed down to a hard for or against when we discounted those kinds of things. We tried to stick to scientific, peer-reviewed journals and government guidance. We did consider those things when people gave them to us, but when it came to putting things in our ordinance, we wanted to make certain that we were on solid ground to be able to back up anything that our ordinance was calling for. Now, as I mentioned, our goal, we tried to make the ordinance comprehensive and to fill in all the shortfalls that we felt that were in other ordinances in other counties. And we wrote it to ensure that our ordinance would try to keep pace with the change of technology. For example, many of the older ordinances simply define a setback distance. And that setback distance 20 years ago was the manner in which the effects of shadow flicker, the effects of sound, and the safety hazards were, were trying to be managed. The expectation was you put an X distance far away and that's going to take care of all three of those things. The reality is those are three different things. So our ordinance dissected that. Our ordinance discusses shadow flicker independent of sound, independent of physical safety setbacks. We also tried to make certain that we recognize that turbines are always going to change in size and scale. So our safety setbacks define minimums and then call out the greater of, so it's got to be the minimum of this or the greater of X times the total height or the manufacturer safety distance. These energy companies buy these turbines from manufacturers. Manufacturers put in their manuals safety distances. If that turbine catches on fire, and we've had three of them that I'm aware of in Worth County, three turbine fires. One of them, you can still see the burned out turbine up there. The turbine manufacturers say, if that turbine catches fire, you need to evacuate everybody out to a distance of X number of feet or miles, whatever the case may be. So our ordinance says, well, if the turbine manufacturer says that's what the safety distance is, then my God, that's the safety distance, not our minimum 1,600 feet. Now, I could go on, I could talk about our ordinance for a long time and go into a number of details, uh, but I really want to have a chance for questions from you folks. Uh, I, I will say that uh, our ordinance is available online on our county website. Uh, there's a rationale document that we produced and a frequently asked questions document that we produced as we were going through this process. Um, those are available online. Uh, the, I, 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 I will point out a, um, a discrepancy, if you will, between what you'll read in the rationale document and what you read in the approved ordinance. The Zoning Commission's unanimous decision and recommendation to the Board of Supervisors was that our safety setbacks were to be property line. Not homes, not buildings, not schools, <coughs> property line. We believe 100% that people's rights begin at the edge of their property, not at the edge of their house. And so we wrote the ordinance to reflect that. Our supervisors decided if they went that way, it would conceivably take too much land off the table for use by wind turbine companies. And so our supervisors made changes to that. So we do still have some property line setbacks, but not, not to the degree that it was originally. So when you read our rationale document and you read our ordinance, you may see that discrepancy there. But our rationale document was created when we gave it to our supervisors, not after they approved it. Because frankly, once they approve it, it's their ordinance. So with that said, what questions do you have?
Yeah, so, yeah, so the question was, I, I talked about a, uh, on the slide here, you can see uh, moratorium approved in April, uh, in early April. Uh, and the question was, who, who approved that? The Board of Supervisors are the ones that approved it. The Board of Supervisors are the only ones that have the authority to pass a moratorium. Now, it could be recommended by the Zoning Commission that the moratorium be enacted, but moratorium is an act that is reserved to the Board of Supervisors. And the Board of Supervisors did it through a resolution. And so via resolution, they went through the, the whole process of drafting the resolution, having a public reading of the resolution, and then ultimately voting on that resolution. And the, I'll paraphrase the, re the, the resolution, I think there's like four or five paragraphs of it, but it essentially cites the fact that we have these issues with the project over in Deer Creek and Grove, and that we know that our ordinances are out of date, and we know this is gonna take some time in order to update these, and we think it's gonna be necessary to update these since we know that there's more projects coming down the road, so we're gonna pause on processing any applications for wind turbines until after we uh, go through this process of reviewing and determining what changes are necessary, and then they gave an automatic sunset of July 1st of 2022 that that moratorium would be lifted. Now, it did come close in June when they were reviewing the wind ordinance. Um, normally, for an ordinance, it goes through three public readings, right? Well, the supervisors had their first public reading. Their second and third public reading, in order to approve it, would have happened in July after the expiration of the moratorium, so they discussed um, extending the moratorium until after they did that, but when they came to the first public reading of the ordinance, there were four people, five people in the room saying, thank you for finally doing this. One person spoke up out of the four that were there saying, thank you for finally doing this, and so the supervisor said, well, if that's all the public comment that we have for this new wind ordinance, then we could probably weigh the second and third reading, which they did, and then approve it, so they didn't have to extend the moratorium after all. Yes? So, and, and again, that's why it's, it's yeah, that, that's why, as I said, I think it's unfortunate that we don't have more of those folks here tonight. Um, so the, the question and comment, rather, was essentially voicing frustration of um, being able to get these, these zoning commission meetings going. So I presume you're a zoning commissioner, but not the chair? Right. Okay. So, any member of the zoning commission can petition the chair and say, I want to add X, Y, Z to the agenda. And then the zone, and then the chair would have to schedule a meeting and go through you know, that agenda item. These issues are the responsibility of the zoning commission. That's, that's when you read the code, about the duties of the Zoning Commission, that's the duty of the Zoning Commission to make certain that they're making recommendations for what they believe should be in place for zoning rules in the county. The Zoning Commission's job isn't to just adjudicate changing this land from this zone to that zone. The responsibility is to maintain the ordinance. And those recommendations originate at the Zoning Commission go through the Zoning Commission process to develop the changes. You have to have a public hearing when you say, these are the changes that we've agreed on as a commission. And then once you've had that public hearing, whether you take action on what was voiced in the public hearing or not, doesn't matter. 
You don't have to do what it is that public, you know, the, that people say during the public hearing, but you got to have the hearing and consider what's being said. Ultimately, the zoning commission then votes on it and sends the report to the uh, board of supervisors, and then they're required to take action. No, no. Now, the, yeah, so the zoning, now zoning commission meetings, because they're a government body, the zoning commission meeting is open to the public. So just like you can sit in and watch a supervisor's meeting, you can sit in and watch a zoning commission meeting. But the zoning commission meeting is just the five zoning commissioners sitting around a table discussing whatever's on the agenda. And if what is on the agenda is we need to make changes to these things or we want to recommend a moratorium so that we can take the time to make these changes because it is a long time, it's a lot of work. And so a moratorium makes sense. And so you just have to you know, tell the, the, the zoning commission chair that I'm a zoning commissioner, I think we need to talk about this stuff and I want to have a meeting so that we can talk about it. And once you've talked about it, you make the motion, if somebody else seconds the motion, you have the vote. And if the vote is yes, we're going to work through this stuff, and you started the process. Now, if the three out of five zoning commissioners say no, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're not going to do this stuff. You know, if you get one person that seconds the motion, but it still fails on vote, well, then you're kind of screwed until you can convince at least one of those members that they need to move forward. But one of the things that they shouldn't be is scared of this legal action. You know, this notion that an, an energy company or some other lawyer sends you a letter and says, you know, there, there's another case over here with the Board of Supervisors, so we don't think that you should be having any zoning commission meetings to talk about this stuff because that's going to interfere with our case. Cock out. It's not. It's two separate things. Your zoning commission, you are obligated by law to maintain your zoning ordinances. That's your job. What the supervisors did, didn't do, will do, won't do, what their court things are, is completely independent of your zoning commission responsibilities. Quick question. Uh, in June, it says that you guys had a public hearing and a vote approving the ordinance. Uh, was it a public vote or was that a vote of the board of supervisors? Right, so our process with, with the wind ordinance, uh, so we had a, a draft ordinance that we published to everybody. We actually sent copies to anybody that had given us input. Uh, and then we scheduled a, a public here, a public meeting a couple of weeks later where a forum much like this where the zoning commission set out the front of the tables and said, okay, who's read the draft ordinance? What comments do you have? And we told everyone we're going to stay here until we've heard from everybody. That was the public hearing. That's what the zoning commission did. Then we went back, we made some changes to our ordinance, then we voted on that draft, and that was the draft that we gave to our county supervisors and said, this is the unanimous, uh, um, or th this is the ordinance uh, by unanimous vote of the zoning commission that we think you should uh, vote on. The board of supervisors then, they, in order to pass an ordinance, they have to have a public reading, or, you know, first, second, and third public reading where in a supervisor's meeting, it's known on the agenda that this ordinance is out there, everybody's had a chance to, to read it. And in that supervisor's meeting then, the public has an opportunity um, to comment on that ordinance. And they, if they don't get very many comments, then the supervisors can waive the second and third meeting, or the second and third public reading. But if they get a bunch of comments, you know, they can have a second and a third uh, uh, public hearing, or public reading, rather, is what it's called. And it's during the supervisor's meeting. Okay, then, uh, not a question, but just a comment. I understand the gentleman's frustration on the zoning board, and here in Tama County, I think that they've made it evident that they vote, voted unanimously to reaffirm the current existing ordinance, and in Tama County, uh, it's, it, it appears to be 
outdated and needs to be uh, readdressed and then at a minimum a moratorium needs to be put into place. We have a, have a, a saying in politics is, that goes something like this, personnel is policy and our board of supervisors is the one that needs to be held accountable. There's an election coming up in November. Do you, we really need to be as the, the citizens of the county, making sure we understand where people stand, uh, the ones that are running for our votes and make sure that we all get behind and support the person that's going to support our rights. I agree hundred uh, percent. And again, I will say that the, um, you know, I, I, I know that there is uh, legal action in the courts right now with regard to the supervisors having voted to reapprove the zoning ordinance. The court's going to hear that case and the court's going to decide. I can tell you, Jeff Borbel's non-attorney opinion is that the supervisors violated the statutes uh, that talk about how they're supposed to do these things. Because as soon as this ordinance comes up for a vote in front of the supervisors or by the supervisors, question one should be, did that come to them by way of zoning commission? If not, it should get sent to the zoning commission because th these things, the, the statute said the recommendations come through the zoning commission. Number two, if they are going to say we're going to reapprove this, whether they're reapproving, approving new, approving a change, it's a new ordinance. And a new ordinance requires public reading. Again, that's according to Iowa statute. I don't know how the courts are going to rule it. That's just Jeff's not attorney opinion, but based on Jeff's not attorney opinion, I, can, I would tell you if I were on the zoning commission down here, I'd be having zoning commission meetings talking about do we need to make a formal recommendation to our supervisors to enact a moratorium because it's going to take us a boatload of time to take this on to make change of the changes to the ordinance that we know need to be changed. Explain the words parcel or acres or number of turbines each person signs up for. I don't know the context of the question. Um, to me, a parcel would be a collection of acres that is legally defined and identified under a parcel ID um, in the county land records and should be available on the county GIS or you know, at the assessor's office. Uh, and is it, what was the other part? Um, or the number of turbines each person signs up for. The number of turbines each person signs up for? However many they want. Uh, I mean, the, the reality is um, if, if I'm a landowner and I've got 160 acres or I've got 2,000 acres, if I want to sell my wind rights to an energy company, much in the same way that my great grandfather sold the mineral mineral rights to his property. Now, an oil company could come in tomorrow, if it hasn't expired, I think it probably has, but an oil company could come in tomorrow and start drilling on land because my great grandfather sold the mineral rights to that land. Well, if a landowner wants to sell their wind rights on that land, on his land or her land, that's their prerogative. Now, as far as how many turbines go on that land, that's up to the energy company. Because one of the things that these easements, and, and I, I gotta say, if, if you're a landowner considering signing these easements, by all means, take it to an attorney. There's no way I would sign the easements with, with the language that's in there right now. But understand, it doesn't matter what that land agent tells you, what matters is what's written in that agreement. And we have a lot of landowners in Worth County that almost fell over when they found out what was really gonna happen. We have landowners in Worth County that inherited land from a parent that passed away in the past couple of years that sold the wind rights that 
they were planning to build on that property, and the wind company says, no, 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 you, can't, you, you shouldn't build there because we're going to put a turbine there. Well, no, that's my land. I want to build a house. You guys put a turbine over on this other spot. No, we'll determine where we're going to put the turbine. You sold the wind rights. We'll determine how many turbines are going to go on the property and where those turbines are going to go on the property, and we'll pay you per turbine according to the terms of the, the other agreement. That's how they work. What other questions? Okay, uh, these people are all signed up to have a turban. Do they get out of it? So the question was, the people that have signed up to get turbans, can they get out of it? So first of all, words mean things, and so I want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, people aren't signing up to get wind turbines. What they're doing is they're selling their wind rights and they are waiving, as a part of selling those wind rights, they're waiving wind effects. These agreements talk about shadow flicker, they talk about noise, they talk about safety issues. And when you sign and you sign these easements saying, I'm granting you wind rights over my property, I'm waiving the effects of your use of these rights. Once you've signed away those rights, the energy company then say, okay, we've got all of these acres that we could use, which ones are gonna make sense for us to use? And then they'll determine where they want turbines to go. And that's why you may end up with a turbine on your property, you may not. You may wind up with three turbines on your property. You don't know, and you don't have control over it. But what the energy company will do, in, their, in that first agreement, when you sold the wind rights, you're also saying, I'll sign another agreement that talks about how much you're gonna pay me per turbine if you put a turbine on my property. But that's a separate agreement that when they actually decide they're gonna put a turbine on your property, that's a separate agreement, it's gonna have separate payments. And that's where they're gonna pay you year after year after year for as long as that turbine is there. The wind easement is just, that's a one-time payment. Now, the land agent may tell you, we're probably gonna put X number of turbines on your property and here's how much money you can make. He doesn't know. They've not made their plan yet. They don't know where those turbines are going to go. They're just trying to get as many people signed up as possible so that they can look at all of this land and say, we got enough land to make a viable project. Let's figure out where we're going to put it. My question is, how can a farmer get out of the easement? Can how can you get out of the easements? <laughs> Find a good attorney. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, but it's going to take an attorney. And I know it can be done. I know there's uh, the attorney, in, uh, one of the attorneys in Worth County, uh, Doug Kroll. Uh, I know he got a couple landowners out of their easement. That's right. You don't get a say. Once you've signed the easement, you've signed the rights for them to put up a turbine anywhere on your land. And it's up to them where they put it. I told them, I took that contract, got that fixed to my lawyers, and my lawyers told me what. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would never sign them. You know, just to give you an idea, I, I mentioned this to the folks earlier tonight. I read some of these easement agreements, and I don't know if this clause is in all of the ones or in any of the ones that are happening down here in Tampa County. Um, and I wish I could remember the name of the legal doctrine. Um, is Mike Youngblood still here? Uh, perhaps you'll, you, you, you know the, the, uh, what the name of this doctrine is, but there's a legal doctrine that essentially says, if there's a clause in the contract they could be interpreted two different ways. The court should interpret the clause in the way 
least uh, um, uh, uh, least advantageous to the person that drafted the agreement. And the reason that's there is if I'm going to draft a legal agreement and I'm going to ask you to sign it, the, that doctrine puts the onus on me to make sure that this language is clear. Because if it ever goes to court and there's a clause that is, is um, ambiguous and it can be interpreted different ways, I'm going to be disadvantaged because I wrote it. And so it's there to protect uh, uh, people. I don't recall what the name of that legal doctrine is, but I saw easements in Worth County where the energy company explicitly called out that doctrine and said that doctrine shall not apply to the terms of this agreement. I don't think landowners knew what they were signing when they signed it, but they were effectively saying if there's something ambiguous in here, hey, yeah, take the energy company's side, not mine. I've got one handed to me. It says, it sounded to me that you said if the commission, whether they make changes or not, if they are satisfied with the ordinances, they need no public meeting to inform them. And I'm not sure if that means the supervisors or the uh, zoning commission. Yeah, I, I don't think I said that. Um, what, so I'm, I'll just rehash what I said, and if this doesn't cover whoever asked the question, if this doesn't um, clarify for you, uh, let me know. Um, but what I've said is that new ordinances or changed ordinances or any recommendations around the zoning ordinance originates with the zoning commission. The zoning commission has to have a public hearing, a public meeting, and describe what that new ordinance or republished ordinance or whatever is going to say. They have to have that public hearing. Then after the public hearing, the zoning commission votes on ultimately what they're going to recommend to the supervisors. When the supervisors get it, when the, before the supervisors can pass any ordinance, they have to go through a public hearing, public reading. They have to publish the proposal ahead of time, notify everybody in the paper, publish it at the courthouse, and then during a supervisor's meeting, they have to uh, pause the, supervi the, the supervisor's meeting and open it for public comment on this thing that they're looking to vote on, hear the public comment, close the public hearing, if they had a bunch of comments, they should go through a second and third reading. Again, public comments each time. If they only get a couple of comments in the first one, then they can waive the second and third hearing, or third, second and third reading, and vote on it after just the one uh, uh, public reading. So I don't know, hopefully that addressed your question. If not, if you could rephrase. I have one that's sort of related to the Zoning um, Commission has to post or publish the agenda for the public meeting ahead of time so the public knows what will be on that agenda. That's correct. She's asking if the Zoning Commission has to post the agenda. Yes, the Zoning Commission is a government body just as the Board of Supervisors. They're just not an elected body, they're an appointed body, but they have to follow the same state rules, the same state laws. And you have to have the, the um, the agenda has to be posted to the public in advance of the meeting. Um, if I recall, we publish ours three days in advance. I, I think at the minimum is 24 hours uh, in advance of the meeting, the agenda has to be posted uh, so the public is aware of what is on the agenda and it is a public, it is a open meeting rather, an open meeting being that it's a zoning commission meeting but anybody in the public can attend and listen. Jeff, can you explain just how many permits you have in Worth County? 
you know, Heather asked me, uh, so she, Kathy asked, how many interpreters do we have in North County? And, and Heather asked me that question, same question earlier. Um, I've got it on my laptop, I didn't look. But we've got, um, I think, six wind farms, uh, wind projects, uh, industrial wind projects in North County. Um, a couple of them are nearly 20 years old. In fact, we've got an energy company that might be buying the oldest uh, project right now because it's 20 years old. Uh, they might be buying it with the intent to tear it down and put up fewer taller ones. Uh, so I, I, I have the count on my laptop. I haven't looked, um, but just offhand, I would say knowing the general number of the other ones, we're well over three feet, 350, probably pushing 400 turbines. You can see a wind turbine from virtually anywhere in the county. And to Kathy's point, looking off on the horizon, it doesn't matter how far away, you see those blinky lights just constant. When you first came up with your draft or what you wanted, how did that come about? Was that at a, I think the question that you're asking is, was that all done at a public meeting when you did all your research and you wrote up your draft that you wanted to present to the public? How did you get that all done? At a public meeting or did you work on it as a commission on your own? I think I read in your one thing that you had a group, you had different groups you met with or came with and worked on it? Is that right? Yeah, so basically the question is, how did we come up with the text that is our ordinance that we eventually produced our, our first draft to the public? How did we come up with that? Uh, so yeah, it started off, um, we actually had a couple of meetings just talking about how are we gonna go about this? Uh, and I, I was, I'm fortunate um, in the fact that I'm retired now. Uh, the other four zoning commissioners have full-time jobs. So I told them straight away, I'll take on a whole bunch of the, the behind the scenes work and just keep feeding you guys information. So I did a lot of the information gathering and a lot of the initial drafting of text and, and fed it to them. Um, but we did have, um, interviews with a number of people. In fact, one of our first meetings with the, of the Zoning Commission was talking about, well, who do we want to hear from? You know, we know much about this stuff as the general person walking down the sidewalk, right? Is we're the general person walking down the sidewalk. And so we, we, we need to learn. So who are we going to talk to? So we said, well, we need to talk to the energy companies. They're the ones building them. And supposedly they've got a ton of expertise in it. We need to talk to some conservation folks. We need to talk to our county health people because we hear there's all kinds of problems with these things. Um, and our county is a pretty rural county. You heard we're 77, 7,600 people. So it's a lot of farm ground, a lot of farmers. So let's hear from Farm Bureau. They represent all of these folks. And so that's what we did is we, we sat down and said, who do we want to hear from? And then we, we contact these different folks and agencies and said, we want you at XYZ Zoning Commission meeting on this date at this time to talk about these things and we want to hear what your thoughts and opinions and concerns and directions are. And so that's how we started. Do you know what we're all public meeting? Yes, every Zoning Commission is, is, a, is a public meeting. Um, now we were doing ours, as you saw, during some of the uh, um, COVID crap stuff. Um, so all of our meetings were early on uh, were done via Zoom. In fact, those recordings are still out there on the county website. And we did have uh, people that would listen in. And when we had in-person meetings, and we had several in-person meetings, especially towards the end, um, we did have people that would show up and watch us and listen to us. Could you speak to how you address repowering in your ordinance? Because we're so starting new, but then how do you address Yeah, that? so the question was uh, it, asking, how does the ordinance address repowering? Which is a good question because as I said, we've got an energy company that may buy one of the oldest projects in the county for the express purpose of repowering. 
Um, so initially, uh, the recommendation, again, unanimous recommendation from the Zoning Commission was that if you're going to repower the turbine, you start over. It's a new project. It's a new permit. Now, if you don't change anything, if all you do is replace some components so that it can continue in operation and you don't change the physical characteristics of it, that's just operational maintenance. Go for it. But if you're going to change something, if you're going to put bigger blades, uh, different nacelle, uh, tear down the tower, put up a new tower, any of those kinds of things, reuse the bait, any of those things, it's a new permit. That was our recommendation. The county supervisor said, no, nah, that's too strict, that's too stringent. They ought to be able to increase these things in size a little bit. One of the supervisors wanted 10%, another supervisor wanted 15%. I think ultimately they settled on 15%. And so we changed the ordinance so that now, I, I'm pretty sure it says 15%. If they change the physical characteristics of the, of the turbine, that um, changes it by more than 15%, it's a new turbine, it's a new project that goes through the whole permitting process. There's a question in the back. Uh, I have one question. The question is, at do those meetings have to be public? And they do, it's only in the big meeting. Yes. Did you run into problems where you had a lot of old people that were part of the industrial meeting on the survival meeting? pretty fortunate and maybe it was because a lot of them were via zoom um, so we could mute them so you can't hear them uh, but generally the in-person meetings that we had um, I think people people were, were pretty good that most of the time we had nobody that would sit in or a couple of people that would sit in and a couple of people very often were the same ones We'd see them frequently. And, and they were pretty respectful of the process. They knew that it was not a, a, an open public meeting, you know, meaning for them to, to talk. We did have one or two occasions where somebody would start to say something, we'd, excuse me, this is a zoning commission meeting of the zoning commission members. You're welcome to sit in and listen, but it's not a public participation meeting. And that's all it took. And it's, okay. Now, that didn't prevent people from contacting us as zoning commissioners individually and giving us information and rendering their opinion vociferously or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I think most people were pretty respectful of the, the process. And, and maybe too, because they could hear the zoning commission members talking about all these different things and um, and they could hear the differences between zoning commission members you know we had a zoning commission member two miles that ought to be the, the setback well you know two miles is that's a, that's a that's a bit far what are we trying to accomplish well that way you're not going to hear it well but sound is a whole separate thing let's manage sound with sound measurements Let's address sound, we'll get sound to the appropriate level. Now what's the distance for? Well, the distance is for safety purposes. Okay, well how far do we need to be? And I think everybody was pretty happy when we come up to, well, a minimum of this much, or X times the height, or whatever the manufacturer's safety recommendations are. Since you guys didn't advise, how many windmills have been built? Yeah, um, so I, I chuckle because you know, Invenergy was the ones that precipitated all of this. It was Invenergy that, that was gonna do the project in Freeborn County, didn't like the rules, came into Worth County, violated their verbal promises and put up a whole bunch of stuff over in Deer Creek and, and Grove, and they are the ones that wanna come in and put up turbines in virtually the entire west half of the county. 
they were the ones that we were trying to work with to give us feedback on our ordinance. They refused to give us feedback. They instead claimed vested rights. And as soon as our supervisors said, we're not gonna sign a separate agreement with you, we're gonna pursue our wind ordinance, I think it was two or three days, their court filing hit the district court saying, we want you to grant us vested rights for the Worth County zoning and, and Worth County wind ordinance. We hadn't even passed the wind ordinance yet. The wind ordinance didn't even come up in front of the supervisors until a month or two after they petitioned the court for vested rights. So that process is on hold. Their, their other project in that half of county is on hold until it goes through the courts. There is one other company though, as I said, that are looking at the first wind farm, it's called Top of Iowa One, there's a company looking at that. They reached out to me two, three weeks ago and said, hey, we're thinking about buying this wind project over here because it's just about run its course and we're thinking about buying it, maybe tearing it down and putting up some new ones. We'd like to talk to you guys and find out what your ordinance is. And, you know, what, what's the, the sense of the county? And so I met with them. They said, yeah, we've read the ordinance. Seems simple enough. Yeah, we can, we can follow that. Now, whether they buy it and it goes through, I don't know. But it's just kind of interesting. On the one hand, you get a company that says, we want to be exempted from the rules that haven't even been passed yet. And another company says, well, we've read your rules, and we, yeah, we can follow that. So, I kind of feel that the Benton County uh, supervisors went in the direction that they didn't want any. It would be the 70% or the CSP or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I don't know what the land is like in Benton County, if the vast majority of it is high CSR or not. Yeah. So, but you know, keep in mind too, in, in the context here, Iowa law says, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's instituted in Iowa law, this notion of preservation of prime agricultural land. Worth County zoning ordinance from way back when and our county comprehensive plan um, highlight that Iowa law and the Iowa law and the, and the zoning law in 335, one of the, one of the um, uh, purposes of zoning is to protect prime agricultural land. That's in the code. And so our zoning ordinance says that as well. And so I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, well, our objective is to preserve prime agricultural land. We define prime, ag prime agricultural land as being CSR 70 or above and we don't want to take that stuff out of production, so you can't use it for these other purposes. But it's not just you can't use it for wind. It's not just you can't use it for solar. You can't use it for anything but farming. So you can't put a cement plant there. You can't put a tannery there. So it's not discriminatory. It's just saying we're going to preserve this kind of land. I have a question. solar projects coming in, especially in conjunction with uh, turbines. Um, to the second part of that, no, we've, we've not had any joint solar and wind turbine uh, projects come into the county. We have had, um, I think, one or two small solar projects um, in the past. I, I, I recall you know, we had just a couple of zoning meetings. You know, since, since Worth County up until this month, only three of our townships were zoned. Um, we haven't had a lot of zoning changes. 
in the county. Uh, but I do recall we had uh, we had one zoning change where the farmer came in along with the energy company that wanted to put a solar farm in on uh, on his property. And I don't remember how big it was. It wasn't real huge. Uh, we had a public hearing on it. Uh, people were concerned about uh, dust and things of that nature from the, from the construction. Uh, but that was really the only opposition to it. So we approved that zoning change from ag to commercial, I think, so that was a heavy for so Okay. Is So the question is, if we sign an easement with the wind company and that wind company goes belly up, are we still committed to that easement? Frankly, it's gonna depend on what the terms of that agreement says. My guess is that the language in that agreement, once you've sold those wind easement rights to that company, that company can resell those rights to somebody else. And if they're going out of business, that's probably one of the things that they're gonna do is sell all those easements to somebody else. Yeah, so the question is, if, when the turbines go in, who's responsible for making certain that the, the turbines comply with the rules and stay compliant with the rules? That's a great question, and it's something that your ordinance has to address. And the way we've done it in Worth County, um, it goes all the way back to the application process. Um, and first of all, the ordinance talks about the fact that the energy companies are required to maintain these things up to date. Uh, we have a whole uh, complaint resolution process spelled out in the ordinance that talk about notices to the uh, energy company, notices to the public, notices to the board of supervisors, and so on. Uh, but ultimately, the responsibility to maintain them is the wind turbine, uh, the, the operator of that, uh, that wind turbine. And we take it, once again, all the way back to the beginning of the process, when they submit their application, they have to make a whole list, I don't remember how many of them, 15 or 20 individual affirmations on different things that they are affirming that they are compliant with and will remain compliant with uh, for the duration of the project, or their permit could be revoked, and if a turbine is found to be non-compliant, it has to be shut down, and if the turbine is shut down for more than a year, it's considered decommissioned, and it has to be torn up. All of that stuff has got to get spelled out in the words. So who enforces the ordinance? Another great question. The responsibility for the enforcement of the ordinance rests with the Board of Supervisors. It's their ordinance. Yes? When we discuss the mud paths, those developers were supposed to follow guidelines Supervisors, you know, weren't taking ownership of the company. They're saying it's between the landowner and the wind company. Yeah. The wind company says that the county says that they're fine, but they don't meet the permits. So. Yeah, so if they, if they don't meet the permit, then there should be a process to cause them to, to be compliant. So, Heather's question, and, and Jack, the, the, the the basis of the questions here just a moment ago was with regard to the mud pits. And the mud pits being, uh, mud paths, I guess you call it, the mud paths being not compliant with the permit uh, that they were granted. And who's responsible for that and what should be done? Well, again, the supervisors, through their ordinance, whether it was the supervisor that signed off on the permit or the zoning administrator, more likely, that signed off on the permit, uh, that, that start then with the administrator, if they're the ones that signed off on the permit, they're the ones that should be checking on it to make sure it's, it's compliant. If it's not compliant, they should be notifying the entity to whom the permit was issued and say, make it compliant, make it compliant. I don't care how you do it, I don't care if it's you, if it's a landowner, if it's a McDonald's clown, it doesn't matter. 
you're the permit holder, you're responsible for making it compliant. Make it compliant, there's gotta be something in the ordinance or the permit that gives them a certain timeline that they're supposed to cure that stuff. If they don't, there should be something in the ordinance. I believe there's something in the uh, zoning ordinance um, that they can be fined. I think it's seven hundred fifty dollars. I don't know. If they so we don't have any of that in ours. We have nothing. No, I think other, you do. Other complaint process. Uh, I think there's something in the in your zoning ordinance that talk about um, non-compliance. Oh, okay. I'll look. I think they're supposed to deal with it. I don't know that there's money on it. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I thought I had read the fine. Maybe I'm thinking of ours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but. Yeah, there, there should be, and that's another thing that's important. If your ordinance doesn't have teeth, if there's no, you know, compliance mechanism, you know, permits are just about worthless. They should have expirations, and there's got to be teeth that, that cause them to be compliant. And if if the um, if the zoning administrator or the board of supervisors, because ultimately it goes to the board of supervisors, it's their ordinance. They are the legislative body of the county. Um, if, if they're not causing things to happen that are by statute supposed to happen, and your ordinance is a statute, if your supervisors are not enforcing your own statute or causing the enforcement of your own statutes, uh, I believe there's legal recourse. I don't remember there's a writ of something that essentially is a petition from a citizen to the court saying, this government official is not performing his government duties as written by statute. Please require this government official to perform their duties as required by statute. It's an obligation. We have a question out here. Yeah, so the question was, did we set up uh, rules for decommissioning? We did. Um, and to, I think it was Heather's or Kathy, one of them talked about uh, your current ordinance talks about 15 years down the road, maybe there's escrow that they have to put in for that. Um, so we cover all of that stuff in our ordinance that talk about how they have to submit a third party set, so a set of plans written by a third party that talk about how much it's gonna to take to decommission these things and then they have to submit a certain amount of escrow uh, to decommission them. And it describes that they gotta take these things down, take them away, they gotta repair all the drainage, uh, repair any roads. Um, and we require uh, that they take the land, they take the concrete down, they remove everything down to six feet. Most of the ordinances that you see that talk about decommissioning and, which by the way, the wind companies will tell you they'll do, is four feet. Recall early on I said that we had interviews with all these different agencies and Farm Bureau was one of them. The Farm Bureau rep that we had interviews with early on in our process said four feet is not far enough. They need to take it down to six feet. Our crops are growing that far. It, they, they need to, they go that far to seek moisture in dry years. So our ordinance requires they take it down to 60. I got a question. I was wondering if you could touch on uh, what the hazard coverage provides to people and to wildlife. So the hazards, what are the hazards for uh, of turbines to people and wildlife? Um, well, I say there, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's a great number of them. Uh, Kathy talked about couple of them, you know, the shadow flicker is, you know, that causes people nauseous. We, we had people that, that sent us copies of a video that they took from inside their home. A lot of times, the energy companies will say with regard to shadow flicker, you're only gonna get 30 minutes a day, maybe 50 hours a year. It's not that big a deal, close your curtains. They sent us a, a video in their living room with the blinds closed and you watch the shadow go across three rooms of the house through those closed blinds for 30 minutes. He says, it drives my son nuts. He can't be in the house. He's got to go out back. Is that just at night? No. That's sunrise and sunset, typically. 
It's when the sun is low on the horizon. Well, it doesn't have to be very low for a 600 foot turbine. But when the sun is shining, when the turbine is between you and the sunshine, you're going to get that shadow. And it's like a strobe. You know, it's just a constant in front of your eyes at whatever speed that turbine is spinning. So that's one of the effects. She talked about the infrasound is another one. You know, people, the, the people complain about the audible sound, and there's multiple. There's sounds from the blades that go around, and there's sounds from the motors inside. Well, some of the sounds, the infrasound, is really, it's just sound that is below the threshold of human hearing. We can only hear sounds so low. You know, you've heard them talk about elephants, you know, talking very, you know, they rumble in very low frequencies, and that sound can travel for miles, and they say, People, they, they, you can't hear it, but you can feel it. That's infrasound. It's sound that we can't hear, but we can feel. It's real, and it affects some people. What percentage of people? Not a large percentage, but does it matter? If our job as officials are to protect the rights of the citizens, am I supposed to single out the people that are susceptible to this and say, we're just we're going to sacrifice you. Oh, you. Your ordinance has to has to address those things. With regard to animals, um, I think the the biggest thing uh, of wind turbine effect on animals is uh, bird strikes and bat strikes and bees and you know, whatever else. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife have. Uh, rules that the turbine manufacturers are supposed to follow for environmental studies. And Iowa DNR requires them to submit their plans to the DNR for the DNR to review and make recommendations. The problem is that Iowa DNR recommendations are only recommendations. And the energy company can look at the recommendation and say, eh, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. And unless your ordinance says, yeah, you got to do that, they don't have to. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife says they have to conduct certain studies. And if there are endangered species or eagle nests within certain proximity, then they have to do additional studies. And they have to have a, uh, an eagle take permit and have a, a hazard mitigation plan and things of that nature. Um, but you know, unless you require it as a part of your application, half of the time that stuff is never done. We got eagles in Iowa. We got eagles. Oh yes, we have we have multiple eagles and eagle nests, documented eagle nests in North County. Iowa DNR recommends a five mile buffer from an active eagle nest for wind turbines. Iowa DNR maintains a map of known active eagle nests. So you can go on the Iowa DNR website and, and go through and find it and it will show you where are the known active eagle nests in Tama County. And if there's an eagle nest over here that's not on the, the DNR map, you can submit the paperwork and say there's an eagle nest there, here's the evidence of the eagle flying in and out of it, here's pictures of the little babies poking their head up out of the nest, whatever, and get that nest added to the map. Now, that Iowa DNR recommendation of five mile buffer for eagle nests, I can tell you the wind companies don't like that and they don't adhere to it. They just disregard it in Worth County and their, their plans to us. Our ordinance gives them a required buffer. And our ordinance says whatever recommendations the DNR gave you, you have to show us that you're following those recommendations or explain to us why you sh shouldn't need to follow those recommendations and what are your mitigations. And that's part of the permitting process. If they have any turbines in your county, have you noticed people moving out of your county? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, so the question is, with all the, with the, as many turbines as we have, have we noticed people moving out? We've noticed people moving out and we've noticed people not moving in. We had people contact us when they found out that Invenergy was talking about the worthwhile wind project in the west half of the county. Uh, there were people that were in process of buying land in Worth County that found that there were going to be a turbine 
X far away, according to the Energy Plan, and said, I, I, I'm not buying that. Also, land prices going up or down? Because uh, well, land prices in general are going up all over, all over the state of Iowa. Um, but as far as homes, um, it does affect the, the property of homes. There's a number of studies out there. I think um, I, I hesitate to say because I'm not certain it's Michigan, but I believe Michigan has a study not that long ago that looked at home price values uh, in proximity to turbines. Now, the energy company will tell you that a turbine on the property is going to increase your value because that's guaranteed income. Well, for the land that the turbine is sitting on, that's probably true. But for the house 800 feet away on the other side of the property line, that is absolutely not true. That person's gonna have a hell of a time buying that property, or selling that property. Because nobody's gonna to wanna to move in 800 feet from the turbine. So the question is, you know, those blades being airfoils, if a tornado goes through a, a, a wind project, what's going to happen to the blades? Um, you know, if the blade becomes detached or broke, it's flying. And that's part of that safety distance that I referred to in the manufacturer's documents. Because they talk about how far you should evacuate the area if there's a fire, how far you should evacuate if there's lightning in the area. Thunderstorms, windstorms, they describe all of that stuff in there. ISU has done studies. Uh, Kathy talked about the ice throw a little while ago. Uh, ice throw is a real thing. We're talking chunks of ice, not piece, the small little pieces. We're talking about 50 pound chunk of ice flying through the air. And Iowa State University has done studies and, and they found that stuff goes, I don't remember the distances, but it's a, it's a phenomenal distance that that ice gets thrown. The speed that those turbine blades are spinning at the tips are much faster than what you think it is. I don't know if anybody has that. 200, 200 miles an 200 hour. 200 miles an hour, the tip. that tip is flying. So imagine if I've got a 50 pound chunk of ice in my arm and I sling that thing 200 miles an hour off into, off into the distance. It's going for a ways and it's doing some damage. And it's one of the reasons why our wind ordinance in North County says that they have to have anti-icing built into their turbines and that and ice detection built into their into their turbines. And if they detect ice on the blades of the turbine, they're required to shut that turbine down until there's no ice present. Have you ever heard of one being hit by a tornado? I haven't. I'm, I'm sure they probably have, but I've, I'm not personally aware of them. It might not, might not happen, but I would think sooner or later. Yeah. Well, I know just the, when, as I said, we've had at least three uh, wind turbine fires in North County that I'm personally aware of. Uh, and I know that uh, in, in one case, uh, a lady had gone out and videoed and measured the distance that pieces of the blades, because you know, the blades fiberglass. You know, the fire starts up in the nacelle, that blade's melting. And whatever wind is happening is just carrying pieces off. In some cases, you know, she, she recorded um, pieces of burned material that were over a thousand feet away. And some, in some cases, just whole pieces that have become detached at the wind hit carriage. Yes? If this is such a good deal, why do you start going to something I need this to be human? <laughs> Why, if this is such a good deal, why is the government subsidizing this stuff? Uh, 
It's, it's a great question. Um, I think there, uh, there, there's certain politicians and certain parts of political parties that are just convinced this is good stuff. And you know, the only way that's going to change is vote. We got a lot of coal and we got a lot of natural gas. Yep. Yeah, and I can tell you, there's a lot of times where those wind turbines up in Worth County are spinning pretty good, and there's other times where they're just sitting dead. They're not generating any electricity. Yes? How are they going to dispose of those damaged blades? How are they going to dispose of the damaged blades? That's a great question. I saw, in fact, I don't know if it's still there, uh, probably last year sometime, shortly after I read an article about um, the problems that they're running into now decommissioning these wind turbines. Shortly after that, I was driving down Interstate 35 and come to find out Iowa was one of three places they were shipping turbine blades to from these decommissioned turbines because they can't get rid of them. They're made out of fiberglass and they, they don't have any way to, to recycle them. So what they're doing is the metal towers, those can be torn down and sent in for recycling. The blades and the shell of the nacelle, that power unit that sits on top, that's fiberglass. And they don't have any way to, to cost effectively recycle that fiberglass. So what they're doing is they're chopping them up into sections that are easy to transport on the highway. And one of the destinations was Iowa. It was a spot right up on 35 where it was a boat load of them, chopped up turbine blades, stacked up over here somewhere, waiting to be shipped off to a landfill so that the landfill could crush them up and bury them. But they were having problems with that because of the shape, as they pointed out, their airfoils, the shape of these fiberglass turbine blades are such that when you start stacking them on top of each other, those slippery motors start sliding all over so they can't get up on top of them to crush them. Yes? So the question was, did I cover what Worth County is doing with the money that we're receiving from the energy companies? Uh, no, I didn't cover that. Uh, and it's actually a, uh, a, a very strong topic of debate in Worth County right now. Um, in the past, so let me back up a little bit. When a wind turbine comes in, there's two ways that the county are going to receive tax money from that turbine. One way is through a utility tax. Now the county gets to decide which way they're going to go. The county can say, we'll take it through utility tax, in which case the state of Iowa will determine what energy that project is generating and what those taxes should be, and then the tax money will filter through the state to the county. The other way the county can do it is the county can say, we don't want to go that way. We're going to value it the other way. And the other way that Iowa law says they can value it is for the first, I think, five years, the taxable value or the, you know, the, the taxable value of that turbine is zero. The next year, year six, it's 5%. And it's 5% of the value that the wind turbine company says is the value of the turbine. So let me repeat that just backwards a little bit. The wind company, according to Iowa law, will say, here's how much this turbine is valued at. On year six, the county can tax that company 5% of that value. Each year, it raises by another 5% until whatever year it is, you have to do the math, when it reaches 30% of the value that the wind company says it is, it caps. And that's how much tax the county will get from that term. Now, a lot of counties, Worth County being one, the county supervisors look at that future tax and go, hey, that could be a chunk of change, but you know, we got projects now. So let's tip it. So tip 
if you're uh, just a brief uh, dissertation on TIF. TIF is tax increment finance. TIF is designed to say, if I'm a developer and I'm going to come into Toledo and I'm going to build this huge new facility and employ gobs of people and I'm, I'm going to take this derelict property and I'm going to put this, this facility on this derelict property. But you know, I don't have all the cash right now. So I want the county to work with me and come up with some money to help pay for that in exchange for the future taxes. Because the tax value of this uh, uh, abandoned property, right, this, this derelict property, the tax value is low. I'm going to increase the tax value by building this thing. So the county can effectively go out and get a loan on the presumed incremental increase of taxes that they're going to get in the future to help that project. That's what TIF is for. Well, a lot of the counties, North County being one, is looking at the wind come, the wind turbines and saying, well, that's going to increase in tax, and that's going to give increased tax value, so we should be able to take a loan on that. And so they do. So they take a big loan out now for the next 10 or 20 years that will be paid for out of those taxes. And that loan has to be used for a specific one or two thing project that they have to specify today. And that's how Worth County's been spending that money. What if the company sells out the whole neighbor six or seven years after the project starts? Well, if they sell out, somebody else is still operating the turbine. Okay. And so the, the value, the taxable value of the, of the turbine is still the taxable value. Because, but the taxes that you get 15 years from now isn't coming into the county budget for general use. It comes into the county budget to pay off the loan that the county took 15 years ago for that road project. Yeah, so the question is, can I speak to the county roads and the destruction of the county roads? Um, if you talk to our county engineer, our county engineer will tell you that the road system in Worth County is, is one of the best in the state, the county roads, um, the primary and secondary roads. And I would tend to agree with him that they are generally in very good shape because they've been tipping the crap out of all of those wind turbines <laughs> and building road projects left and right. Um, and the wind companies have had, um, generally speaking, We've had a pretty good experience with the wind companies when they first come in they'll do a survey with the county engineer say these are the roads that we're going to use in some cases they have to um, cut a corner you know across this farmer's field to put in a, a larger sweep turn to get these turbines in and the wind company will put all that stuff in they'll manage the drainage they'll, they'll reseed everything um, and, and they'll maintain the roads, and then when they leave, they'll tear out those extra ones and, and things of that nature. So they've generally been, been pretty good about that, but at the same time, we've had document, we've had agreements on that. And you know, we've, like I said, we've had five or six projects that are in place now. Uh, so I think our, our county engineer has learned a lot of what should go into those agreements. And we strengthened that a little bit in our ordinance. But, that's the key, is to make certain that before the permit is even issued, they have to agree to these kinds of terms and do the surveys ahead of time, manage it. You have to have a, a process in there whereby citizens can complain about things and how those complaints are adjudicated, how much time the energy company has to, to resolve things, dust control, all of that stuff. So Jeff, how often are you going to review the wind energy ordinance from here on out? Is it a uh, is it required like every five or ten years? Are you going to look at it yearly, like in case it's a really good one for your county, which is good, but there still could be technology and things have changed. So right. how often are you going to? Yeah. Review so the it? question: How how often are we going to review the wind ordinance and, and potentially change it? Uh, you know, we should be reviewing ordinances. If an ordinance is on the books. There's no ordinance that is managing this level of detail 
this should go beyond three years before somebody takes a concerted look at it and say, what have we learned over the last three years uh, that may need to update? Now, presumably, as things come up, you know, as things are highlighted through experience, um, you're going to make incremental changes. But incremental changes aside, I think there should be a formal process where every three years you're doing a comprehensive review and say, okay, is this still adequate? Do we need to make changes? Well, that's good to hear. We were 12 years and the wind farm was approved at 10, year 10, so yeah. and they weren't reviewed for 12 years, so. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of it is, it's sight, you know, out of sight, out of mind, right? If it's not been used, if there has, you know, the, the ordinance has been there for 10 years, but there's not been any projects, it's just sitting on the shelf, and out of sight, out of mind. Um, you know, and, and we're guilty of that in, in Worth County. You know, I, I discovered that um, when I became chair of the Zoning Commission, I started looking into this stuff a little bit more, and one of the things I found is that our comprehensive uh, county plan is supposed to be reviewed on an annual basis by the zoning commission, and then updates, uh, you know, update recommendations made to the supervisors. Our county plan is dated 2006. I've been on the zoning commission for probably 10 years. I don't remember the chair ever bring it up for review. It's on our agenda now, we're going through, a, in fact, we're going through a massive review because you know, it, it's super, the, the plan is whole, it doesn't say anything at all about turbines or, and it says we want to preserve land, we want to preserve conservation areas, and blah, 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 blah. How well have we done? I don't know, that's part of what we're reviewing now. No, uh, the ordinance, that, well, our zoning ordinance talks about solar, but it's pretty weak. Um, and we have on our agenda to update, to either update language in the zoning or create a separate solar, not sure yet. Um, but what was recently passed in June for the wind ordinance was just purely wind turbine. Any other questions for Jeff? It's some of both. Um, they'll hire you know, some of the early management of the operation because what, what will happen, well, I, I can't say this will happen, what frequently happens, and if it's a company like Invenergy, their business model is to come in, go through the application process, get the permits, and immediately sell the project for somebody else to implement. Very often, the company that implements the project, as soon as they get it implemented, they turn around and sell it to another company that's gonna operate it. So, the first energy company, they're not hiring a handful of people, and those are the land agents that are going around stretching things to try to get people to sell easements. The company that comes in that's gonna build it they're gonna hire some people local, but most of them, they're coming from outside. Because it's it's a big energy, you know, it's, it's a big company that specializes in building these things. And so they just hopscotch from one project to another. The operators, when they take over the operation of it, they'll hire some people local that's gonna maintain it. And they'll set up a little shop somewhere, they'll have an office, They'll have some of their folks will come in from somewhere else initially to start the operation, training some local folks to take over the operation, and they'll hire local folks to train them to do the maintenance, to you know, be up in the towers and climbing and doing things of that nature. Those will be some local folks that are doing the general maintenance. And then for the specialized stuff, then they'll bring people in from outside to do it. So there, there's a few that get hired locally.
Yeah, so the question is, do we work well with the zoning administrator? And Tama County seems to um, depend on the zoning administrator to initiate things. I think that last statement is probably true for a lot of the rural counties and maybe even some of the, the, the larger counties as well, where there's a dependency on the zoning administrator. And I think historically in Worth County, at least for the 10 years that I've been involved, that's been true, that there was a dependency on the zoning administrator. And again, not trying to make an excuse, but we had three of 12 townships that were zoned. Um, we got very few requests to change zoning from here to there. And you know, we're just appointees, Joe off of the street. You wanna be a zoning commissioner? Sure, why not? I can read. And there was a dependency on the zoning administrator to initiate things. When I became chair, well, when I first, I, I was asked to be um, in, uh, interim administrator because our administrator passed away. And so that's when I first dove into it. And I dove into it, reading state law, reached out to ISU to get some training, read through our ordinances, read through our plans, and went, oh, crap. Zoning commission's supposed to have been doing a whole bunch of this stuff all along. We haven't been doing it. And why do we only have three of 12 townships that are zoned? That's not fair. And so I raised those things to the supervisors. Um, and then it was just in 21, that uh, I was elected as chair of the commission, actually at the beginning there. Um, and that's why I said, well, you know, I, I can read, I, I see what this stuff says, so it's the responsibility of the zoning commission. If you read the duties of the zoning administrator, the duties of the zoning administrator is to process the applications, manage the permits, according to the ordinance and act as secretary for the zoning commission. That's the duties of the administrator. The duties of the zoning commission are to draft and recommend ordinances, et cetera, et cetera, related to zoning. And I think there's a lot of us that get started in this stuff don't realize that crap. This appointment job seems to have a lot more responsibility for this stuff than the zoning administrator that we've been counting on all this time. It's not the zoning administrator's job to originate these things. So part of it's just education. Yes. Somewhere in there. That, that's not an exact one. I'd have to look at my laptop and look at the different farms. All of them had the zoning before March of 2021, or are they just starting? Oh, no, those those have been going in since 2000. Oh, gosh, you guys have been like that. Well, we're going to see what's going on. Yep. Yeah, there's very, there's very few of them. Very few of the turbines in North County ever had to have a permit.
the correct answer. Um, Richard's got a question for us. Not a question. Channel 7 was here for a short amount of time. I did a short interview with them. If you get home by 10 o'clock, they're hoping to have it on by 10 o'clock. Yeah. Otherwise, I hope it's on tomorrow. Uh, but the young lady said her producer has COVID, so she's, she was in Cedar Rapids, came here, set up for a few minutes. That's why I left, to do a short interview with them. Uh, so listen to that. I hope I said the right things. So, thank you. Richard did a great job, I'm sure. And um, again, we would like to thank everybody. We would also like to acknowledge our uh, absent. We're going to talk about a little bit. We're going to touch on the lawsuit that Richard filed. Uh, Richard Art is the plaintiff. And uh, Kathy will touch on that. One thing I would like to acknowledge is our supervisor candidates. Kurt Milmer and Randy Bright, and we appreciate your attendance. Thank you, John. Uh, we have been trying to uh, represent the interests and the public safety and public health of the people of Tama County. The Tama County Against Turbans Coalition just formed on March 23rd of this year. And just like Jeff said, we've all learned a lot about this, but we care about this county. And we have tried to provide uh, solutions and opportunities to our current Board of Supervisors. Unfortunately, they haven't been as willing as the people in Worth County have been to look at change and updating the ordinances. So when it became apparent that they had violated the Iowa law by reapproving the old wind ordinance that hadn't been changed since 2010 and hadn't changed substantially since 1998, they did that on May 16 without even holding the public hearings that are required by Iowa law. So we felt that was wrong. We knew that was wrong by Iowa statute. You heard Jeff speak to the process here today. So Richard Arp has filed a lawsuit against the Tama County Board of Supervisors to hold them accountable for following the Iowa law and holding the required public hearings and public notice. And we know that in this case in Tama County, the supervisors did not reach out to our zoning board. They did not get input from the zoning board. This coalition has been presenting each week to the Board of Supervisors since April 25th. So on this Monday, that represented 14 straight weeks that we have been there. We have presented action items and solutions. When they fail to take action to protect all of us, and future generations and our farmland and our livestock and our wildlife, we took it to the courts to hold them accountable for following the process. Because we recognize that there's a lot at stake here for current generations and future generations. And we want to say thank you to all of you who've come here to be with us tonight. We are a coalition of volunteers. None of us receives a dime for doing this. We're doing this as labors of love on your behalf. And we thank the many of you who have helped us help you with your contributions. There are several ways you can help support us in our legal fund. For example, if you sell grain at Team Event Cooperative, either Cloutier, Dyser, or Venton, all you have to do is deliver your grain and tell them how many bushels you want to donate to Team County Against Turbans. And I see many folks in the room that have done that, and we say thank you. You can also write a check payable to Tama County against turbans. We've got yard signs. You've seen them all over Tama County. A suggested donation of $20 a yard sign. The shirts we're wearing are also fundraisers, and those are a suggested donation of $20. We want to tell you that we're in this for the long haul. We've been very clear with the Board of Supervisors that we intend to do everything that is legally possible to protect the people and the precious farmland of Tama County. We're doing our homework, we're doing our research. We're reaching out to people like Jeff and learning from others who are going through similar things like we are. Because this is important and the time is now for us to learn, the time is now for our elected and appointed officials to listen to what the public needs now in the future and for us to protect our rights because we want to get this right. And now is the time to pause any further construction of wind turbines 
to give us the time to get those ordinances updated to make it safe for everybody, whether you choose to have a turbine on your property, but especially if you don't and you have to live near them. So that's what's at stake here. We thank you very much. We, we uh, Diana Widmer sends her regrets that she couldn't be with us here. She grew up in this area. She worked in Powasheet County and lived down there around wind turbines. She's 34 years old. She's got heart trouble from living around wind turbines. Her eight-year-old son went to school in Montezuma. There's turbines a mile within the school at Montezuma. This little eight-year-old boy was being sent to the nurse every day because he was getting migraine headaches at school from the impact of the turbines being so close to the school. And as Jeff said, turbines can sometimes impact people really severely. And Diana Widmer and her son are examples of that. There's also animals that can be severely affected. And I drive down V18 a lot, and I see this one pasture. And there's cattle in the pasture, and there's turbine in the pasture. And I feel terrible for these cows. Because every time I drive up, whether it's morning or night, here's these poor cows in the corner of the pasture, up or close to the fence, as far away from that turbine as they can get. So we've got to make decisions here that impact lives, whether they're human or animal lives. And that's why we're here tonight. We thank you. We hope you've learned a lot. There's other ways you can continue to learn. We've got our own YouTube channel. You can go to Tama County Against Turbans. We've also got our own Facebook channel. So our Facebook group is also Tama County Against Turbans. And we're committing to help provide education and information to help you make informed decisions. We're also committed to holding our elected officials accountable to protecting all of our health and all of our safety for future generations. So we thank you for being a great audience. We mentioned we have the maps up here. If you'd like to learn more about the specifics on projects and footprints and that sort of thing, but thank you for spending your evening with us. Let us know how we can continue to help you. And if you'd like to get involved in our coalition, the more the merrier, because we've got folks of all ages. And you'll see us in the Winding Stair Parade <laughs> in Trier coming up in August at Cloutier Fun Day. So if you want to see our float up close and see that scale model, take a look. And thank you again for your support. And let's give Jeff Gorbel one big round of applause. Have a safe trip home, everybody. Remember to watch Channel 7 tonight and in the morning. Thank you.